This broadcast is inappropriate for all ages. It's right here on Hashtag Women Club. I am Camry. Uh, scared my cats left and right. But uh, I am on my own due to some mishaps. Um, some unfortunate life incidents. We were not able to broadcast last night. Um, it's not anyone's real fault but our own. Um, I messed up some timings trying to see this movie in theaters this weekend. Uh, Sid messed up hers. Um, honestly, we had, we had abandoned it. Um, and we we're going to try to pull an audible and, and switch up movies for next week and just move on. Um, but I got a wild hair up my butt. And I went to one of the theaters on the ass end of nowhere to, uh, it's not that far, but it's far enough away from where I live. It just, it was was close to work, but it wasn't at any of the theaters. It wasn't at the theaters near my house. It wasn't at the the theaters near my work. Like I work like catty corner from a movie theater across a cross section of highways right now. Um, there is a movie theater probably about five minutes from my, my house that wasn't showing Hail Caesar. Um, it seems like it seemed like it was very select theaters, and I was honestly mourning any movie that went up against Deadpool that was released because Deadpool was so insanely popular that, quite honestly, um, I felt bad for the movies. I felt bad for movies that weren't Deadpool. It's just the fact of it. Um, it it's it's amazing how well Deadpool did several weeks out. Like it was still selling out like in the third week, which is amazing. Um, and Hail Caesar, poor Hail Caesar, which I swear to God came out around when Laser Team came out. Um, it's just in its death throes. It's getting out of there. Um, and arguably a better movie. Now, I enjoy Deadpool probably more than I will enjoy any other movie that comes out this year. I say that, but we'll see. We'll see. Um, and I don't have a full camera frame because this is designed for two people and I didn't want to redo it for one. Um, and shame on me, I guess, for being lazy. I just liked it. I, I liked, I like simplistic artwork. I'm not very good at things, but I thought I did okay with, uh, Caesar down here in the corners. Um, and for our audio listeners, ap- apologies for going out there, and there's no Sid this week. Um, so double, double sorries. But, um, what was I going to say? Uh, so I, I would argue that Hail Caesar is a better movie, even if it's not as entertaining. Um, there's this weird, uh, how do you say, um, subjectivity to what makes a good movie. Whether or not it's enjoyable doesn't necessarily mean that it's a great artistic piece. But just because it's a great artistic piece doesn't necessarily mean that you enjoyed it. Like, Family Guy's funny. South Park might be funny. Um, but you're not winning awards for those shows. People aren't going to remember that fart joke from that time or, or whatever, 10 years down the line. And it's proven because they're, those shows are more than 10 years old. It's, you might remember like one or two jokes, but you're not going to remember everything from it. Um, and I guess there's a fair equivalency to dramas, but dramas are the ones that tend to stick with you a little bit longer. Um, Watchmen is not, it was barely a superhero movie one. But it's not nearly as entertaining as Deadpool is. It's got it's got its moments. Um, but, god damn, Watchmen is heavy enough and classic enough and serious enough and powerful enough that it's going to stick with you. V for Vendetta still sticks with me. There's that one scene on the roof uh, that still kind of like echoes in the back of my head from time to time. Um, it's, it's just, they're just wonderful friggin' movies. Um, and they're award-winning movies. And I'm not saying Deadpool's not good. I'm just curious at what award it could possibly win. Um, other than, like, best gore or uh, most brutal uh, one-sided fight. Like, it, it's, it's the paper plate awards show is what that is. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit back and I'm going to adjust this a little bit, I think. If I do that. Yeah, that works. There we go. Yay, video problem solved. Woo, woo, woo. But we are here today to talk about Hell Caesar. We're not necessarily here to talk about Deadpool anymore. It's always good. Um, now, the way I, I want we we tried to structure this, and I'm not here to hash this out. We've got to get do a couple of these to try to get the right feel for it. Is that we were going to do a spoiler-free section, uh, scene by scene, and then a wrap up and talk about it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to keep the spoiler-free section, but I don't have the scene by scene 
this week because this movie ha- is uh, I just didn't have the time to spend with it that I needed to to make that that notes. But I'll definitely have it for Watchmen. You can guarantee that three hours of scene by scene. <laughs> um. <laughs> so uh, my initial feeling again is that it's an award winning thing. It's it's actually got several things buried. It's totally worth going to the theater to watch. Just don't spend an extra 30 bucks on food and drink or whatever. Um, I t- wanted to try it out, and that's how much it came out to be. It's just what it is. Um, so, what was my point? <laughs> uh, totally worth the, the ticket price, um, at least at a matinee, um, uh, to go and see that because it's that good a story. It reminded me a lot of The Majestic. Um, and for those who've seen the Majestic are gonna uh, get ahead of me on this one. There's actually one. Of, there's several storylines that are looped in this. Um, a lot of movies like Snatch, Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels. Um, there are several other ones that have multiple storylines going on at once uh, that weave together and make a beautiful movie. And you could actually pull probably any one of these stories out and make it its own thing. In fact, if I was gonna present this, I would present it as a television show that showed the same set of events from different people's perspective. Um, and that's how I would have done it. I would have done like a mini series. Um, cause this could totally do that. It, it's, it's all there. There's a noir film in there, uh, for like uh, sussing out this mystery. There's a, a communist, uh, red Hollywood thing going on, which is why it reminds me of the majestic. Plus it's from kind of the same time period because it has to be, uh, I think the majestic actually came out a little bit later. Um, there's, there, there's a couple different Hollywood stories going on here dealing with the actors. Um, there, it, it actually reminds me a lot of Sin City in, the, in this idea is that there's several stories overlapping um, and where the movie stars are in place of superhero type comic book characters. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's really impressive to see that um, in that space. And then there's a whole story about uh, one man like leading his life and, and what path to take. Do you take the easy route? Do you take the hard route and love it more? It's, it's, it, is it worth the sac or sacrifice to, uh, to deal with things? Uh, even though it's, it might be hurting your family and it's tearing you up inside. Uh, there's so many good things and that's all without spoiling anything. That's all based on the premise of the movie that these things are going to happen. Um, and, if you're paying attention to the trailer, you can actually pick out little bits and pieces and confirm this. Um, you can even pick out um, potential spoiler, 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 uh, the kidnapping. So even that's in the trailer if you're looking at it properly. But if you haven't seen that sort of thing, I can understand maybe getting upset at that one. Um, but really, honestly, good movie. It's got George Clooney, Scarlett Johansson, uh, Channing Tatum. It's got a bunch of little guys that you may or may not recognize. The the original author from Once Upon a Time is in there. Um, the evil hacker from Hackers, <laughs> I, is here. Uh, he's in there. Uh, I could have sworn Patton Oswalt was one of the writers, but maybe it was wrong. Um, if you look at that whole crowd of guys, you recognize a lot of them. Um, and you're like, oh, wow, I didn't know you were going to be in here. And I don't know your name, but I recognize you. Um, which I think is part of the point, if you pay attention to their, their whole little storyline. Um, some of the actors and, uh, and extras and stuff that you see in there, you definitely can recognize. Um, the, gen- the older gentleman uh, from the guild uh, who plays the fighter, um, I can't remember his name right now, but he's in there, uh, and uh, I was real happy to see him back on the screen because I, I enjoy him in general. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see. Uh, so it's got a great cast. That's, that's one of the things that like made me like vet it. It's like, okay, if it's got that good a cast. They're probably going to do something funny. Like, oh, it's a, it's going to be a celebrity writing thing. They're going to put in lots of gags and referentials. They don't do that. They actually, uh, are just having them be big roles. Um, they use the bigger actors to, as the bigger actors back in that day. And that's to the point of trying to make them look special, which, they are to the stories, um, I, but it's it's that 1950s feel. They're still wearing suits and hats. Um, ladies are dressed up a certain way. Uh, the Chiquita Banana Girls in this. 
<laughs> it's totally worth dropping them dropping the the money or the time to watch this and but I understand that it wouldn't do well um, and I understand that not everyone's going to like it so take that into account um, but if you are paying attention to the multi-thread story and you are into movies at all in production they, they show some water ballet they show some tap uh, which they don't put in movies anymore for whatever reason uh, probably because people don't like it um, and that's fine but uh Channing Tatum does like a tap dance in the sailor, and I think that's in the trailer. Um, so that was interesting to see on the screen and, and watching it break down and watching like Western type stuff for action scenes. But watching them, like they, they show you enough of it to make you go, oh yeah, I kind of know how that's going on, and I know that they have to do this and this and this. But it's interesting to see that, uh, how do you say, um, that, that break the camera angles because obviously they would have more cameras than they have out there um, to get the shots that they need and when they go back and rewatch parts of the thing you you know that they've got extra cameras there and it's of course it's a movie studio but when you're in the scene you may or may not notice there tends to be only be like one camera around and that's that's what it is it's what you do for movies and the cameras aren't the focus. The people are the focus. There's a lot of talking in this. It's a lot of. It's very dialogue driven. Um, there's obviously some very major movement scenes uh, to move the plot along, but a lot of it's in the dialogue. Um, and that you even have some uh, very brief expositions from the main character uh, Eddie. Oh, what's his name? Eddie something. Mannix, I think. Yeah, Eddie Mannix, um, who's kind of like the, the the Hollywood producer. He's the guy uh, trying to make sure that everything gets done, and he's pretty good at his job. Um, it's it's kind of a crazy thing um, to to imagine doing as a job uh, and being able to do it well enough to be as well considered as he is. Uh, man, so uh, without further ado, I'm I'm gonna end the spoiler free section. And uh, we are going to get into the uh, a synopsis of sorts. I'm not going to be able to go scene by scene. And I'm on my own, so I'm not going to be able to banter with myself to, uh, to do this. We are entering the, the spoiler section of uh, the podcast. And I'm about to talk about some of the synopsis of, of what's going on. Um, like I, I said before, there's a lot going on. And I should have made sure I, that feed was working. Um... There's just such a delay on YouTube, it's insane. Uh, let's see. Okay, so the the general synopsis is that Eddie Mannix uh, is in charge of getting things done and fixed at the things. Some people have made it their means to kidnap a celebrity something braid. No, braid something. Um, so they kidnap braid, and then investigating this, he's dealing with all these Hollywood problems. There's... Uh, an actor who's switching uh, personas. He's trying to go from being a cowboy to a more serious actor, doing dialogue and whatnot, changing up his image. There's a a, 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 a girl, uh, Scarlett, jo played by Scarlett Johansson. They're trying to maintain her image. They're trying to legitimize her son, which is done in like a very odd way, honestly. Um, I'll get back. I'll circle back into that. Uh, so some of these scenarios get caught up the other. Um, Eddie Mannix is uh, constantly dealing with a job offer to go over to Lockheed, which, if you don't know, is an uh, air tech company. Um, they make airplanes and, and drones and things like that. Um, uh, so it, it's a big deal, even back in the 1950s. Uh, so it would have been a steadier job, less crazy hours. Um, but the guy who's interviewing with them is kind of telltale of the environment that he'd be walking into where his old industry wouldn't be respected because what they do in Hollywood, granted there's some schemey weird stuff that goes on and there's a lot of things that I wouldn't side with them on, but I do declare it a, a legitimate industry. It's definitely people who work hard. They're not just people who sit back and count their money, most of them. Um, there, there's a lot of things that have to get done and there's just 
not enough people or money to go around sometimes, and you've got to get that done. So it's the the big wigs, the biggest of bigs. Those that's where you the, they're the ones that get vilified that don't do anything, but they're the ones with all the capital to make it happen, and it's got to pull together somewhere so that it can distribute down to to the workers to make the movies happen. And it's so it's this weird kind of love hate relationship that you can have with it. But that's the, the, that's the side. That's our good guy. If you're going to break this into protagonist antagonist, our protagonist, our main protagonist is Eddie Mannix, um, along with some of the actors uh, and whatnot that come across. Um, depending on your perspective, of course. It, it's So the evil corporate Hollywood guy is the good guy, if you will. But and it's not today's industry. It was the 1950s industry, and... Those guys look out for uh, the people who, who make it happen for them when it comes down to it. I, I, I can't, I, like, I feel so conflicted in that. I feel like I've got to present it one way, but I feel like defending it for the movie's sake. Um, man, my nose. Stupid cats. Uh, so he's, he's, like, doing this detective sleuthing type thing. It's very noir-esque. It's like he's got to figure out all these different things that are going on. He's trying to maintain his life. He's trying to maintain his work. And he's dealing with this uh, impromptu kidnapping that that happens. And it's a movie studio, so of course they have $100,000. Uh, back then, that would have been like a million. Ugh. Um, and we have this fun thing where, like, they try to put it in a suitcase. <laughs> and... Uh, like it just it just won't fit. They actually have to put a belt around it, which is the giveaway. Um, if you if you needed a not a red herring, MacGuffin maybe I don't know uh, a mechanic to uh, move that plot along further on. That's uh, that's the one. That's the one right there for sure. The belt. Um, there's got to be a proper name for it in the movie type industry. Um, so okay, so the the main storyline with George Clooney. George Clooney is playing an actor, a famous actor, who's doing this big thing for a movie called Hail Caesar, which is actually a funny continuing bit. They've got the name of the movie at, in the name of the movie as a movie inside the movie, along with all these other little movies that are being done, um, and then we're actually shown from both the perspective of the movie uh, being made and the crew making the movie, which I just find is interesting. If you work behind the camera at all, um, on any level, you tend to look at things differently. If you analyze movies uh, as a hobby, career, or what have you, you start to pick up on things. You, like, I, 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 I've done, I've, I've, I've looked at movies one way for a very long time, and I started shifting, looking at it differently. I finally got into a mindset where, like, hey, I can do this and talk about it, and that sort of thing changes how you watch movies in general. You can turn that part off and just enjoy a movie, but if you get the opportunity and you start looking a little bit deeper, it's it's pulling a thread. That whole sweater goes, and you're down the rabbit hole um, looking around at all the wonderful things. It's really a different way to watch, and I highly suggest you try it. I suggest you do it in video games, too. If you read books, look at how it's structured. Look what goes into making it what it is, and and you get a little bit more out of it. It's really great if you never did this, and then you start doing it, and you go back and rewatch movies that you only enjoyed before, and look at them like on a next level deep. It's 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 a whole new experience. Um, so it's just a really fun part of the movie for me. Uh, let's see, let's see. But uh, okay, so George Clooney's playing the actor. They they roofie him or whatever, and they get him the hell out of there, and. Uh, they kidnap him and put him on a beach house, and it turns out, what do they call themselves? Uh, it's almost like they're a book club. Um, they call themselves like students or historians or whatever, uh, and it turns out to be a Communist Party meeting. Now, I want to be very upfront on how I feel about it, not to get super political. I was really hoping for some deflection from Sid. Um, but uh, how I feel about it and what the, what the importance of it is. Communism itself, especially in very small sections, uh, is not a bad thing. Now, what your immediately reaction there is like, oh, you're a commie, whatever, you hate America, etc., etc., etc. Now, I'm anti-capitalist when it comes to that sort of thing, 
but I am not necessarily for a dictatorship, which is what the chief problem is. When we had problems with the Soviets, it wasn't that they were communists. That was just a key, uh, something simple we could go against. It was that they were under an imperial dictatorship, um, that they were actively, aggressively taking countries from other people to make the USSR. That was what our problem was. The communist angle was just something to differentiate very simply, and that's what you were taught to hate. There, it's just a difference in ideals. Um, and <laughs> the state we're in right now, uh, it, it's it's not the best. Um, so, regardless, that's the point. And that's, they actually did a really good job about this, um, because they actually uh, show, uh, again, we're in the spoiler section, they actually show them conversing with the enemy, with the USSR. Um, very clearly, um, these were traitors to the country. These were not just communists, people that had an idea of, of the people working together for the greater good. These were people who were uh, Soviet, Soviet loyalists. Um, that's what they wanted, uh, for whatever reason. And, uh, yeah, it was kind of a weird thing to have in a movie. It really was. And, uh, like, and that's the, that's how those things grow because communism makes a lot of good points. Uh, and it makes a lot of good ideals, practical application, not so much because people are shitty and they don't like working for things that aren't themselves. It's just a fact of it. Um, so again, problem with this is that the uh, Soviet loyalists and uh, traitors to the country. country. Uh, so that was actually a really interesting angle to explore in this movie. Uh, not to mention some, some of the stupid scenes that happen with them. Um, <laughs> it's not that I forgot my point. It's just that it's actually so funny that I'm thinking back on it. Uh, and they, they put in a twist uh, like Chad Tatum. And I would say Chad Tatum is actually probably good representation of ideal America. It's, he, he's, a, he's an actor. He's good looking. He's talented. He's successful. He's rich. Blah, 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 blah. blah. He's popular. Um, people fantasize about him. I think that's a, those are good benchmarks for what the American dream suffices of because it means that uh, he, he could or he could or, or eventually could just choose not to work um, and live life uh, or get all the benefits out of life without a lot of the cost. Um, and I could see that, that being something that people look up to. Um, but they use him as the ringleader, even. Um, and then the very funny bit about, like, the $100,000 they used to ransom George Clooney's character um, was supposed to go to pay the, uh, the communist writer's sect, or cell, there you go, um, to fund them, their, uh, for whatever reason, um, but like whatever reason, they tried to give it to Tatum's character to give to the USSR, which is weird. It's just a weird moment. Um, so they toss in the briefcase, and he makes a big to do of it. Still understand how he was standing on the rungs of a U boat like that, but and then like the funny bit where his dog tries to jump and and go with him, and he drops the hundred k because he's an idiot. Um, so it's this nice, subtle point of, uh, yep, communism gets you nothing, uh, because it was their communistic ideals of giving the money away, uh, to the cause instead of keeping it for themselves, i.e. capitalism, that caused them to lose it and it not go to any good. Uh, and you could tend that to corruption. I don't know how you, uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you compare corruption to a little dog. He's kind of cute. Um, but maybe it's a, you could relate it to uh, misguidance or distraction. There you go. Um, so they had to row back with nothing and get busted by the cops, and that was fucking hilarious, uh, honestly. That uh, the other actor, Hobo or Hobie or whatever, this is my water. Get out of the camera. Um, that he uh, managed to save the other actor, Braid, um, and only because it was his belt that was used on the suitcase. That's what that's what I was talking about there. Um, 
Because Maddox, like, he loses his mind at a certain point. He, like, confides in, in the actor who just happens to be in his office of all the weird things. And then Hobie goes about his night as he's supposed to. He just happens to run across the, the guy with the briefcase and follows him to Braid. It's it's such a simple storyline that, that, that there's any mystery involved, any investigation into, into kind of what's going on with it is amazing. Um, but Hobie... Hobie or Hobart or whatever his name is is actually an interesting character because he, he plays like the simple everyday man but the idea is that he's actually got the right idea on this serious situation like immediately he's like you should look at the extras and he can't even say extras which is part of the plot point in his storyline that he's in this very to do role where he's supposed to say uh, wooden, t- wooden twer, and you cannot do it. I can barely do it. Wooden twer, um, wooden twer is simple, uh, which is a nonsense fucking sentence. Um, twer not as simple. Uh, would be too simple, or would not just be as simple. There, there's so many other ways to say that. It's like wooden twer is just like verbal masturbation. Jesus, um, does not belong in anything. Uh, so let's see, let's see, let's see. Um, but like, so immediately he's the one that's like, you should investigate the extras and they don't. So that starts the whole thing. There's this whole, like, I don't know if they're assistants or what, but there's this working path off Mannix that happens because he's a big producer. He's a guy in charge. He's a busy guy. He's constantly looking at his watch, trying to keep time and keep, uh, schedules on, on when he has to do what and when things have to happen. So it's like he has to fit this kidnapping mystery into his schedule so that everything else doesn't fall behind as well. Um, and he's got to deal with these other problems, uh, like the Scarlett Johansson thing. Like, we get this nice segment, but we could honestly drop her whole storyline and it would be fine. Um, but it fills enough to keep things interesting, keep things well-paced, and keeping this other thread in the woven story, um, trying to manage her life uh, along with things. And I think the... Those scenes are actually involved in other 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 scenes as well, or other storylines as well. So they're like a meeting point. So while he's there, it gives him a place to be for things to happen um, to progress the other storylines. Uh, but like, there, Jonah Hill plays Joe something, um, and he's a professional person uh, and notary, which I think is funny. Um, but he's a good, he's just like a good guy who does the things. For the the studio, like he spent six months in jail for him to, for for something. Um, and what's funny is like they were gonna have him adopt her kid to legitimate or to to have him be a foster parent so that she could adopt her own kid back from him. And uh, instead, she just like marries the guy, and that's all we hear from it. Which is such a funny way to like just wrap up a story and to give Jonah Hill of all people a cameo. But um. It was a cute little scene. Um, I'm really happy they they kept that in, because um, again, I think they could really cut all the Scarlett Johansson stuff, um, and either talk about it just kind of offhandedly, or um, they could just ignore it altogether. And I think it would have been fine. Now you couldn't eliminate the Channing Tatum thing because the whole point of that is to uh, give plausible deniability for. Uh, him did not be involved in the conspiracy because it's supposed to be this great surprise that he's the one doing it because he's playing like a Navy soldier. I'm sorry, seaman. Uh, now, of course, he's dancing on a bar, but uh, like all those things I said before, plus he's playing a Navy uh, seaman sailor, uh, if you will, in the movie, in the movie. So... He's supposed to be this great American guy, and it's just it's funny to see those kind of things flip. Um, and it, it almost makes me want more of his story. Like, I want the part from before to see how he gets to that point of joining the Coalition. Now, all for whatever reason, all the communists uh, in the club are writers. They're all writers that happen to be that. Um, and they're all kind of like ones that got screwed over on pay. Um... So I don't know if it's the capitalist idea that's supposed to create the communism in them, because if they had been better paid, they would have 
been well compensated enough to believe in the capitalism and not wish for a more even distribution. So it's this weird juxtaposition of capitalism creating co uh, communism or the urge therefore of it. And it's a really fun idea, um, but I don't know if they're just trying to play off Marxism or not, because the whole like idea of Marxism is that um, if you do not, if the structure of the economy does not keep a, a redistribution of a somewhat even amount, that the the poor will rise and overtake the rich, because um, it's the equalizer. It's like if the, if the rich are dead, then they aren't rich anymore, and then the money trickles down another level, and eventually it equalizes. Um, and that's the idea in capitalism, is that <laughs> if people die, then eventually you everybody ends up closer. But we, we don't do that here. <laughs> Not like uh, the ideal should, or the ideal of cap capitalism should allow. Um you've got to be able to eliminate things for, for capitalism. Capital, uh, is throwing a stake into a dog pen. That, that's what it is. It's, it's a lot of, uh, what's the, oh, not Freud, um, Darwin, Darwinism. A lot of Darwinism in action. Da, 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 the more you know, la, la, whatever the, the sound bite is, I can't remember. Um, clearing. But, uh, it's a very it's it's very interesting for everything. It, I like movies that make you think, and not everyone likes movies that make you think. Um, if you ignore all those aspects or everything they're talking about goes over your head, great, you've got this whole other thing. You can get behind like, oh, I've got a problem. I need a solution. Um, I need to uh, I need to find my guy. I need to save him. And it's great that it works itself out. There's a couple funny bits where like he's so stressed out. Uh, and he's trying to find solution. He's trying to put all this extra effort in, and then in the end, it works itself out. the The communists uh, end up getting caught themselves. Like Hobo, Har Hobie doesn't even call the cops. Um, they busted him on their own because I think somebody noticed the U boat pulling up. Honestly, um, the the issue that he's having with his kid in baseball works itself out. Um, the situation with Scarlett Johansson's character works itself out. Uh, there's at least one more thing that I can't remember exactly what it is. Uh, we're gonna about, and then there's the plot that I completely forgot. It's one. It's my favorite scene in the movie. The the whole thing with Hell Caesar is, I don't know if it's supposed to be. No, it's not Caesar himself. Uh, it's supposed to be legionnaires marching on Israel. Uh, so George Clooney plays one of the, one of the generals or whatnot, and he's going to drink. Like the whole premise is that like he meets the Son of God. Jesus Christ, or Jesus of Nazareth, whatever your words of choice there are, um, and he sees the light of God in Jesus, um, and so he's so moved that he works his he works his way to the crucifixion, and he uh, kneels before this Jew on a cross, crucified for his crimes. I'll put those in quotes. For those who can't see me, I'm putting crimes in quotes because it's, regardless of how you feel about religion, dude got fucked over one way or the other. Um, and uh, so, like, there's this whole dialogue between him and another legionnaire, like, why are you doing this? And he's explaining himself and explaining the, the way he, he feels uh, about Jesus. And um, it's, it's actually this really great scene. I want to see that movie. Um, but the point is, is that because of all this, all this religious connotation, uh, Eddie Mannix is like one of his duties is to make sure that it is approvable for general audiences and that people aren't going to revolt in the streets about this movie. Very much as we saw with Passion of the Christ, and people got all up in arms. Um, and this is not that movie. But back then, the standards were a lot different. In the 1950s, just putting Jesus on the screen at all, whether direct or otherwise, was kind of a weird thing. And uh, they don't show him getting beat to death. 
<laughs> in their movie, but it was enough controversy they wanted a uh, committee of religious experts. So they brought in a Catholic priest, they brought in a Protestant minister, a Jewish rabbi, and an Orthodox priest. Um, and for those who don't realize the difference between the things that I said, um, I'm sorry. It's, that's a much longer conversation. I already went way too far into capitalism versus communism. Um, the briefest synopsis that I can I can give you is that Catholicism um, was not the original, but it was the first place that it really started branching inside the Christian family um, as different sects started to cement themselves. Orthodox uh, was probably the next strictest, and then from there, uh, more things broke off, and pretty much everything else, actually including Orthodox, honestly, is uh, Protestant, um, and if I'm remembering correctly, uh, the Byzantine Empire, uh, the Protestants uh, actually had their own pope, and the Order of Orthodoxy is the same, is the sect that is following that. I don't know. Um, it's, it's It gets a little confused. I know that it's very European for the most part. Uh, a lot of the Mediterranean parts have it, but we're, they're here too. Uh, and the Protestants are the ones that really kind of moved uh, anywhere there's English speaking and then came over to the Americas, um, minus the, the Spaniards and the Portuguese who were all Roman Catholic. Uh, there's your history lesson for the day um, in religion. <laughs> Jesus, this movie really covers the bases. Um, but it was such an interesting thing to see those uh, actors, like, truthfully hold to what their, their belief system were and have a religious discussion that I would like to see a whole podcast on at some point. Um, now, granted, it's a fictional movie, so there's nothing to actually to discuss, but um, my, maybe there's a, a similar podcast or something about passion, uh, Passion of the Christ, that... I could watch because it was super interesting to see like the Jewish guy just be like this fucking nonsense what are you talking about this man there's no God in this man and like there's like the man explaining like uh, how do you call it uh, not umpire but um, equalizer in the conversation um, just trying to keep the peace um, mediator that's the word so he was like, isn't there a little bit of God in all of us? And then, like, even the rabbi kind of like went, yeah, well, maybe. Uh, uh. But um, it's just so funny to see who was actually up in arms about what and and uh, who was more serious. And, like, the general consensus was that, no, no one's really going to be offended by this. Um, but are you doing a great job of portraying our religions or our what do you call it? Um, our perspective on the religion, because that was that was what the whole argument boiled down to in the room. That was actually the interesting part. The part directly dealing with the movie wasn't as interesting, <laughs> but um, just like uh, that that like picture of like religion, because religion has a history just like anything else. Um, and it's so funny that a movie that is currently in our history or showing our American history, stops for a second to talk about the history of something else uh, that's even bigger than it, I, I just find that very interesting. Um, again, like I, I really think this is a award winning movie, not necessarily for any individual aspects, but for the creation of itself as a whole. No one's going to be like that time where he's giving this big dramatic speech and then fail, forgets a word. That's not going to be the thing that would earn it an award. It would be the overall story composition um, and I, I really enjoy it um, there there's and there's oh god but like the one scene that really sticks with me is when he's in the confessional uh, and he's talking to the priest and he's trying to figure out what to do with himself and he's like is it wrong to do the the easy thing even if it's not a bad thing um, than to work hard and stay at the thing that's hard to do even if it's the better option because the whole point of the movie for Mannix's storyline he's trying to quit smoking the whole time is that he's dealing with weakness uh, someone who's so strong a character is dealing with uh, this insanity and um, it's it's really very interesting to see uh, that struggle example and it's exampled into cigarettes and uh, throughout the movie you're constantly seeing him say hey can I have some of that 
no, I'm not doing that. And then, like, you catch them later. Uh, and it's all kind of related to stresses and outside his life and, and uh, particularly dealing with his family more than anything, uh, which is interesting because the, the way he, he operates, his work fa- he has a work family as well, and he's got friends and associates and whatnot um, that he deals with on a con- constant basis. But uh, it's it's just neat to to roll back time sometimes and see those things, and, and I don't particularly enjoy that time period. Basically, if we gotta go back in time, I kind of want to go back before World War Two, and World War Two itself. Anything with Nazis is just old to me at this point. I'm so they're exhausting, they're like just worthless people like that. Just I can't I can't put the effort in anymore. Um, but and then like the sixties get like a little weird, uh, and. I, I like to avoid the whole Woodstock era. Um, and then when you get to the 90s, that's that's my – or the 80s, I'm sorry. That's my present 90s I grew up in, the aughts I'm living – I lived, uh, the, the aught 10s uh, I'm I'm in now, so this is definitely the present. So it's, it's, it's funny to see my perspective on history change, uh, whereas I saw, like, the Majestic and, like, that was definitely in the past. And, like, that's – there's no question about it. It's like, that was that. Um, but there's enough aspects of this that make me think about and compare it to modern day, when obviously the whole movie is set in the past. Um, so it's weird that I have that distinction between the two. I'll, I'll have to figure that one out on my own. Um, it is just me doing banner with myself. We're, we're about a half hour on the timer, and uh, I, I ran before on Jam on Toast on accident. So... I, I would like to wrap up. I'd like to talk about my feelings uh, sport, uh, in general now that I've talked about some of the individual plot points. Um, I definitely feel like this movie deserves an award of some kind. It's not going to be Best Picture. It's not going to be... Um, you no know one's going to get it for Best Actor, Best Supporting Role, or anything like that. But it's definitely a movie that makes you think. It's meaningful. It's powerful. It's got great met- underlying metaphors for life and... A look back on how film is made and was made back then and oi 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 I, I just I really liked it um, it's definitely a movie I plan on seeing again uh, hopefully once it goes to Netflix or DVD and uh, I wouldn't mind pulling this back up and just to talk about it again this is one of those movies that I would like to talk about uh, with people at a later date instead of uh, by myself in a very one sided manner because I'd like to hear other people's opinions and things on the movie. So if you have watched this so far and you have opinions and things, by all means, leave it in the comment of wherever you happen to watch this or listen to it, as uh, we do appreciate that. And of course, uh, as always, if you like this or dislike it and want to talk about that, uh, talk about Hail Caesar or talk about We Are Movie Club or or join us even possibly. Um, tweet at us at We Are Movie Club. Let us know you're interested in whatever you're interested about. Uh, if you need an off-topic, I particularly suggest bananas. Um, apparently, they can range from four to seven sides. Um, so if you want to talk about that, great. But, uh, of course, there's always the movie of the week. This week's was Hail Caesar. For next week, we're going to be doing The Watchmen. And um, I hope that uh, people go and watch this and chime in. Because this is another movie that I really like like to talk about. And hopefully uh, we can keep this sort of thing rolling. But uh, even if we don't do it next week, it'll be the week after. Um, but we'll, we'll watch The Watchmen and we'll come back and talk about it. And it'll be a good time. So uh, until... Um, oh, jeez, where's my mouse? I can't end the thing if I can't find my mouse. Um... So thank you so much for watching if you did or listening. And uh, until you see me next time, I am Camerai. And that has been hashtag we are movie club. If you want to see anything else we're up to, go to click the annotations and it'll take you to our other channels. Thanks for watching.